breaking news this Wednesday night. President Trump is impeached a second time. He must go. He is a clear and present danger. The Republicans who turned their backs on him. There's no way I could vote no on this. Plus, security concerns for Joe Biden's inauguration. The confusion over Ontario's new stay-at-home order. I can't stay inside all day long. What's permitted, what's prohibited, and what's still not clear. From keeping cases down to a virtual lockdown, why Ireland is no longer crushing the curve. Plus, a penalty of the pandemic. I can't really foresee myself getting painted up to sit in my basement by myself. Is excitement on ice for the new NHL season? Global National with Donna Friesen. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. This is the moment President Donald Trump was impeached for a second time. The American House of Representatives charging him with incitement of insurrection. He is the only American president in history to suffer this fate. Good evening and thanks for joining us one week after an angry mob of Trump supporters attempted to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power in America. Lawmakers held President Trump to account. Those insurrectionists were not patriots. They were not part of a political base to be catered to and managed. They were domestic terrorists and justice must prevail. But they did not appear out of a vacuum. They were sent here, sent here by the president with words such as a cry to fight like hell. All Democrats in the House voted to impeach, and this time they were joined by 10 Republicans who for the first time turned their backs on Trump. I'm afraid patriots of this country have died in vain. I'm afraid my children won't grow up in a free country. I'm afraid injustice will prevail. But truth, truth sets us free from fear. My vote to impeach our sitting president is not a fear-based decision. I am not choosing a side, I'm choosing truth. It's the only way to defeat fear. This vote to impeach is similar to a criminal charge. The next step is a trial in the Senate. If convicted there, President Trump would never be able to hold public office again. It looks likely that won't happen until after his term ends in one week. Our Jackson Prosco is watching history unfold tonight. Jackson. Well, Donna, no matter how this ends for Donald Trump in the Senate, he will not be able to erase the stain of a double impeachment from his record. And this second history-making impeachment comes as his entire political empire is crashing down. In a scene reminiscent of the American Civil War, armed soldiers are posted inside the U.S. Capitol to defend against a domestic threat. The eyes are 232, the nays are 197, while members of Congress carried out an unprecedented second impeachment of a sitting president. Donald Trump is a living, breathing, impeachable offense. He must not remain in power one moment longer. Not one moment longer. The danger is too great. We must impeach. This time, the effort to remove Trump has bipartisan support. I will vote yes on these articles of impeachment. Even Trump's most loyal allies who object to impeachment admit he must still wear the charge of inciting violence against the government of the United States. You'll never take back our country with weakness. For his words in the weeks and hours before the Capitol was stormed. The president bears responsibility for Wednesday's attack on Congress by mob rioters. He should have immediately denounced the mob when he saw what was unfolding. Those who did object insist the process was both rushed and needless just a week before Trump leaves office. Well, so what? That's called politics. If we impeached every politician who gave a fiery speech to a crowd of partisans, this Capitol would be deserted. Democrats believe Trump poses a danger given the ongoing threat of domestic extremism by his supporters threats that could disrupt the inauguration of Joe Biden. And we know that the president of the United States incited this insurrection, this armed rebellion against our common country. With the House voting to impeach, Trump's fate rests with the Senate, where the highest ranking Republican Mitch McConnell has said he has not made a final decision on whether to remove Trump from office. The matter may not be taken up until after Biden's inauguration, solely to keep Trump from running again. 
Tonight, Trump finds himself increasingly alone and isolated in his final days in the White House. Corporate donors are fleeing, business opportunities for the Trump organization are drying up, and that threat to bring it to the Senate could also bring an, an abrupt end to Trump's future political plans, Donna, because the big picture plan here is to keep Trump from running again in 2024 and hanging over the Republican Party after he's gone. And Jackson, President Trump has said impeaching him will lead to more anger. Joe Biden and his team were briefed today by the FBI and Secret Service about the threat picture for the inauguration on Wednesday. Give us a sense of the security level. This is really alarming stuff. The 20,000 members of the National Guard who are being brought into Washington, D.C. are being told to prepare for things like improvised explosive devices in the crowd and in and around the city after those two bombs were found one week ago during the ride on Capitol Hill. We're also told they're being told to prepare for things like mass casualty events, which is why the Biden-Harris administration is stressing the need to get a better picture of the security challenges they're going to inherit on day one because Donna is clear the threat of domestic extremism will not simply vanish with Biden's inauguration. It will not. Jackson Prosco in Washington tonight. Thanks. Late today, President Trump put out a video statement on the White House government Twitter account. His own account has been removed. Mob violence goes against everything I believe in and everything our movement stands for. No true supporter of mine could ever endorse political violence. It is too late, of course, for a growing list of businesses which are cutting ties with Trump and his family, including Deutsche Bank, which has been his biggest lender. And today, New York City dumped Trump. Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the city will be severing all contracts with the Trump organization. He says New York can break the deals if the vendor's leadership is engaged in criminal activity. The Trump organization operates a carousel and skating rinks in Central Park and a golf course in the Bronx. The deals are worth about $17 million U.S. a year. The political upheaval in Washington is having no impact on the pandemic, which is still raging across the U.S. Yesterday, the U.S. had a staggering new record for COVID-19 deaths. In just 24 hours, more than 4,300 people died. The virus has now killed nearly 400,000 Americans. Canada is faring better, but the situation is increasingly worrying here, too. More than 6,800 new cases have been reported across Canada today. More than 150 more Canadians have died. Most of the new infections are in Ontario and Quebec. But the impacts of the virus are widespread. Here's the map of Canada adjusted for population. Right now, Saskatchewan has the most active cases per capita, 319 infections per 100,000 people. The next hardest hit is Alberta, followed by Quebec, and then Ontario. Ontario's premier says his stay-at-home order, which comes into effect at midnight, is crystal clear. But that is not how a lot of Ontarians see it. There are complaints it is anything but clear about what people are allowed to do or how the rules will be enforced. Our Abigail Beeman went looking for some answers. They need to get out to get fresh air. And the province of Ontario says under the new stay-at-home order, you can get outside-ish. You must, I'm going to repeat that, stay home it's the law and it will be enforced. But there were so many questions about what exactly is allowed after Tuesday's announcement, the Premier's office had to issue this FAQ list for journalists Wednesday morning, trying to tackle what's an essential item, trip and work. But in each case, Ontario cannot determine all the answers, as every Ontarian has unique circumstances and regional considerations. We need everyone to use their best judgment we pushed the province on one big question, enforcement, especially around outdoor exercise. Can you get a ticket for being outdoors in a park or at a skating rink? Your household may have fewer than the five person limit, but what if other people show up too? A government official told Global News bigger groups would break the rules, but enforcement is up to local officers and said we should direct all questions to them. We're still unclear. I can tell you that uh, other law enforcement entities, uh, provincially and uh, regionally and uh, municipally, are, are looking for um, clear direction from the uh, province. Neither Toronto nor Ottawa could lay out a plan for parks, rinks and toboggan hills. We have asked the province for greater clarity around a number of aspects. And I hear some elected officials, uh, local ones and other ones, oh, it's confused. Folks, there is no confusion here. It's very simple. Stay home. Given the bleak nature of, of our restrictions and what's going on today, giving people the ability to exercise and be outdoors, 
uh, is probably a, a human right. We should probably be prescribing, given that it's not a particular risk. We end up burning the public's trust and the public's energy. Health experts believe getting outside safely is important. Dr. Stephen Burrell provides clinical care to Toronto's homeless population. He's particularly worried about the inequity that persists. Not everyone has a backyard in which to isolate. I was sort of reflecting on our experience back in March of last year when we had one client who came to us with an $800 ticket for sitting in a bench. He wants the focus to be on support rather than enforcement. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Late today, the Ontario government did release the formal stay-at-home order. It's four pages long. It contains 29 exceptions to the rule, including going to work, going to the bank, going to the airport, to travel to another province, and walking the dog. In some long-term care homes in this country, the promises to protect residents are being broken. Today, Ontario hit a grim milestone. More than 3,000 residents in long-term care homes there have now died in this pandemic. 40% of homes have active outbreaks right now. For months, Premier Ford has promised he'd do everything he can to stop it. So what went wrong? Mike LeCouture is looking into that. If, if uh, that's, that's required, in my opinion, some homes are, it's required. For a moment, it seemed Ontario Premier Doug Ford was again preparing to send Canadian troops to help the dire situation in long-term care homes, saying he was offered the help by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau just an hour earlier. So I'll, I'll take him up on that offer, but I just want to make sure once they come, where they're going and where we're needed uh, most. But in a statement, the Premier's office tried to walk that back, suggesting the military isn't needed right now, saying, quote, we will continue to work with the federal government, and if any further support is needed, we will request it. And the confusion doesn't take away from the serious problem facing long-term care homes in Ontario. 249 homes, or about 40% of facilities, have COVID-19 outbreaks, and geriatric specialists are criticizing Ford's claim that he was going to put an iron ring around long-term care centers to protect them from the virus. Many of us are saying it seems like it's more of an iron sieve because the staffing plans that BC, for example, and Quebec did, where they hired thousands of new workers uh, and made sure that they could be on the front lines ready to go in the second wave, has actually done a lot of good. Some jurisdictions prevented personal support workers from working at multiple homes to help stop the spread, while Quebec increased salaries and paid for training to attract more employees. But that hasn't happened in Ontario. She's 82. Um, before COVID, she was very alert. Jessica Wong's grandmother caught the coronavirus at the tender care home in Toronto, and she wonders why more wasn't done in the second wave to keep the virus out. If there's no visitation and none of the residents are leaving the home, then it's brought in by staff. Ford acknowledged that, saying security guards are going to homes to do checks. To make sure every person that comes in gets checked, to make sure it's documented when they were tested, uh, when was the last time they got tested. The Ontario government hopes by doing that and ramping up vaccinations in long-term care homes, they'll put an end to the out-of-control outbreaks. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. More help is on the way for Canada's Indigenous communities dealing with COVID-19. The federal government is spending $1.2 billion for more PPE, staffing and other support to help slow the spread of the virus. According to Canada's Public Health Agency, there are now more than 4,300 active cases on First Nations across the country. And numbers are rising fast. Last weekend, more than 800 people living on reserves tested positive for the virus. These numbers continue to be alarming and have now exceeded the national average and will continue to do so if gone unchecked. The Indigenous Services Minister says he's encouraged by progress in getting vaccines to remote and Indigenous communities, but he says logistics are complicated and the rollout will take time. He's urging people to keep following public health orders. Air Canada is slashing more than a thousand jobs. The airline is blaming increased federal travel restrictions and quarantine requirements. Air Canada says the measures have had an immediate impact on bookings and led to a 25% scale down in operations. About 1,700 jobs will be cut. 200 employees at its express carriers will also be impacted. Air Canada began cutting routes on December 8th. 
This week, the airline revealed it will stop flying into New Brunswick's capital and to two communities in Newfoundland and Labrador. An investigation is underway tonight in Montreal after one of that city's largest synagogues was vandalized. A warning some may find the image disturbing. MP Mark Miller tweeted this photo showing the anti-Semitic symbols painted on the doors of the synagogue. A letter sent to the congregation says the graffiti has now been removed and a man is in custody. He's expected to appear in court tomorrow. From success to a surge in COVID-19 cases. Coming up, why Ireland is now struggling to contain the coronavirus. Back in early December, Ireland had one of the lowest rates of COVID-19 in Europe, but that has changed rapidly. It now has one of the highest rates per capita in the world. Since the new year, around one in 70 people in Ireland have tested positive for the virus. And today, the country announced 63 new deaths, its highest daily death toll since April. Experts say the main reason for the surge is not the new, more contagious variant of the virus that emerged in nearby Britain. It is human behavior. Redmond Shannon explains. Ireland is almost in full lockdown, the most stringent measures since last spring. The country has been blindsided by a recent spike in COVID cases. We're seeing deaths rising in a way that actually not only uh, equals our situation back in March and April, but actually exceeds that. And that, that's really, really shocked all of us. Shocking because Ireland had been doing relatively well. In early December, Ireland's case rate per capita was a fraction of Canada's. But through Christmas and past New Year's, it has shot up to become among the highest in the world. Part of the problem may have been Ireland comparing its performance to other European nations, most of which had very high infection rates. Unfortunately, I believe we, we didn't get the figures down adequately in early December, but then there was a lot of expectation and almost political pressure on the government from retailers and from the hospitality industry to open up and ha have some sort of save Christmas, if you like. Fatefully, the government decided to allow limited Christmas socialising. The Irish love Christmas is the, is the main reason here, I guess. And and with the best wood in the world, there, were gonna, there was going to be households mixing anyway. And it looks like as if that was far too extensive in a sense. And uh, one example was they were trying to restrict families mixing. So two families were allowed. People clearly broke that rule and had more than more than three or four households mixing over successive days. The new, more infectious variant is now more prevalent, potentially brought in by emigrants from the UK coming home for the holidays. It might be part of the story, but the main reason, as I say, is behavioural change. But it is there and it's spreading, so it's even more important to restrict movements and so on. Like Canada, Ireland has just introduced the requirement for a negative test result for all arriving air passengers. That move and Ireland's overall strategy is compromised by its open border with Northern Ireland. Its rules more closely aligned with measures in Great Britain. Redmond Shannon, Double News, London. Still ahead, ice jams build up flood fears in BC. An unpredictable situation is developing in northern B.C. Ice jams on the Nechaco River are threatening to flood low-lying areas around Vanderhoof, a small community west of Prince George. Four and a half thousand people who live there have been told to exercise extreme caution. The ice is causing the river to fluctuate about a meter overnight and temperatures shifting above and below freezing means the ice jams can release without any warning. We now have a better idea how smoke from wildfires impacts air quality in the U.S. According to a new study by researchers at Stanford University and UC San Diego, wildfire smoke now accounts for up to half of all fine particulate pollution in the western United States and 25 percent nationwide. The concentration of those tiny pollutants roughly doubled between 2006 and 2008. Researchers say the warming climate and decades of fire suppression are driving the wildfire smoke. A Polish zoo is celebrating the first birth of a rare rhinoceros. At one week old, this Indian rhino is still learning how to walk. The unnamed female calf is now one of 172 kept in zoos around the world. About 3,000 of them remain in the wild. The birth is a big victory as zoos fight to save the endangered species. If a hockey puck drops with no fans around, does play go on? Next, the NHL starts a strange season. 
Hockey fans have something to look forward to. NHL hockey returns tonight. The league is focused on keeping the game alive and players and staff safe from COVID-19. But there are already some problems before the first puck is even dropped. Mike Drolet reports. There's so much that doesn't make sense about today. For one, opening night in the NHL has never been in January. And when Montreal plays Toronto, there's an unmistakable buzz in the city that is just not there. It seems pretty bleak out here. It's just like January gray. If there's anybody who can add some color to the situation, it's the Leafs super fan known as Dark Guy. He made a name for himself. Well, you can see why. And while he has an amazing ability to get the crowd riled up, until the pandemic is over, he'll be in his sports cave, at home, alone, and makeup free. Well, I've had, I've had that question brought up to me a couple times, uh, and it's just like, I can't really foresee myself getting painted up to sit in my basement by myself. It's a bit of a bummer, but he's hoping a little hockey will lighten the mood, especially in Ontario where a state of emergency is in effect, although that could potentially backfire on the league. One of my friends actually had a pretty like clever joke. It's just like, yeah, no gatherings of more than five unless you're in the NHL. And yes, COVID has already had an impact with 27 players testing positive, including 17 from the Dallas Stars. So the NHL is skating on thin ice before the first game is even played. I probably would, would put finishing the season at a 50-50 chance. Oh boy, not a lot of positivity there. Well, how about this? Any hockey fan will smile at the thought of the pond hockey games planned for Lake Tahoe, not on Lake Tahoe like some players thought. I have never uh, skated on a lake my entire life. We're playing on the 18th uh, fairway, bro. No, take, I didn't even know. You can take a take, you can take For a, real? Oh, you just crushed my dreams. In 2021, the dream is simple. Play the games, award the Stanley Cup, and give us reason to cheer again. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight, we leave you with a tribute to one of Canada's greatest rowers. Kathleen Heddle, who has been called the Mozart of her era, has died of cancer at the age of 55. The two-time Olympian from Trail BC rode her way to three gold medals. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.